This lecture introduces you further to the social network perspective on organizations, but it elaborates how networks influence organizational behavior and outcomes, and it describes ways organizations can create different network patterns and positioning. When we study the effects of networks on organizational behavior, we view social relations and actor positioning as an independent variable shaping outcomes. We consider whether people influence one another and diffuse their motivations through their friendships, or if being in key locations of the network have certain returns or advantages for the worker and the firm. When we consider network formation, we look at the network as an outcome or as a dependent variable. Here, we want to know the factors that lead persons to form relations and factors that lead a network to assume a particular shape and perhaps even a, a pattern that you as a manager or as an analyst desire to, to bring about. So let's look at these using examples in the slides that follow. First, let's consider how relations influence behavior, or what we call peer influence. The general argument of peer influence is that people we associate with uh, change us, they, they affect us, and they lead us to act in ways we wouldn't normally, normally act if we were out on our own. So in organizations research, these studies often focus on the process of social diffusion and the adoption of organizational innovations. Some research studies uh, whether collaborating with productive colleagues increases your productivity, so a test of whether a particular mentoring program has solid returns. But in most of these studies, researchers find that close ties are a great means to diffusing attitudes and behaviors. At the interorganizational level, scholars find that the adoption of organizational innovations often flows through associations like interlocking boards of directors or alliance networks. For example, a string of papers found that the use of poison pills in corporate takeovers was an organizational innovation that spread via interlocking boards of directorates. The poison pill, for those of you wondering, was a strategy that many firms would use to prevent takeovers in the 1980s and 1990s. It was a, a way of making the firm seem like an expensive, low-profit gamble uh, whenever they were being put under a takeover. And so because of those kind of moves, they were seen as not worth taking over so that the takeover would quickly uh, disappear. Within the context of a single university, Craig Rawlings and I have studied how faculty productivity diffuses through collaboration networks. We found that a university could improve its grant record by getting successful grant seekers to collaborate with novice grant seekers. Those kind of collaborations improved application rates, success rates, and the amounts awarded. The diffusion of expertise was even greater when these collaborations were repeated more than once, thereby ensuring that novices learned how to get grants on their own and with others in the university. So persons who did not collaborate actually struggled to win awards in comparison with their collaborative peers. So we think about this in the context of the larger university and the prior lecture, that, where we ended the prior lecture, you could imagine how engineering faculty collaborating with those in the social and humanistic sciences or fields uh, would benefit uh, from those kinds of collaborations and induce them to become more of a grant seeker or funding of doctoral research uh, projects. In other work, the conduit of influence is not a strong tie, but a weak one. Mark Granovetter has written some seminal work on social networks, and in particular he has made a strong case for the importance and usefulness of weak ties. In his research on job seeking, he finds that most people learn about a job and acquire it through weak ties or indirect ties of friends of friends, rather than their close friends. And he argues this is because weak ties often bridge groups and bring people into contact with more unique information. Persons that rely purely on strong ties and cliques mostly find redundant information. So persons with weak ties have uh, more access to new knowledge about job openings and therefore successfully acquire jobs. Strong and weak ties are often characterized as bonding and bridging forms of social capital or types of association that bring social advantages. Strong ties and bonding capital generate social control and conformity, as well as socialization and diffusion. While weak ties and bridging capital often extends a person's reach into pools of useful information. So strong and weak ties imply the creation of certain network configurations and network um, positions 
And therefore, I, I want to turn to next uh, the effect of positions on outcomes. A common finding uh, within organizations is that persons occupy certain positions within a network and those positions afford them all kinds of advantages. For example, like the access to recognition and information. And this kind of positioning with those kind of advantages enables the occupant to be, to be more successful in their, their careers. The same can be said of interorganizational networks. Organizations assuming prominent or brokerage positions tend to survive, grow, and have greater control and influence on the field of organizations in which they're embedded. David Crackart offers us a nice illustrative example of the effects of network positioning on firm behavior and firm outcomes. He describes the case of a technology firm that is the subject of a unionization effort. According to Crackart, the unionization effort fails because union proponents do not co-opt the informal leaders of the strong tie network. I find Crackart's case to be simple and elegant. Um, he first describes the organizational chart of who reports to whom, and he identifies the collective bargaining unit that the union tries to establish. Then he goes on to show how the key union proponents are neither central to the advice network of experts, nor are they central to the friendship network of trusted relations. Here's the organizational chart, and you can see the potential bargaining units circled by the dotted line. In it, I've highlighted the three leaders of the unionization effort, Hal, Ovid, and Jack. The anti-union members are outside the unit, Robin and Mel. And the key experts or advisors of work-related tasks are outside as well, and that's Ev and Steve. Only the informal leader, or the popular friend named Chris is in the union, but he's not very interested, as you'll see. Here's the advice network. Crackart gave the employees a survey to get this sort of information, and then he entered the information into social network software uh, to generate the network graph. Um, the pro-union leaders are highlighted in red, and they're notably very peripheral to this network. The anti-union members are highlighted in blue, and they're notably more involved in the advice network. Um, the last, the two key players uh, I've highlighted in green, and that's Evan Steve. And from this, we can see that the unionization leaders won't put a stop to the expertise uh, network, that's for sure. The next image is of the friendship network. And again, the three pro-union players are highlighted in red, and they're peripheral. At the center is the informal leader and popular pal, Chris. And notably, the anti-union members are closer to Chris and likely have greater sway over his opinions. In sum, the case study uses interviews, surveys, and observational records to retell the story of how a unionization effort failed because the pro-union players were peripheral to the informal organization. They neither co-opted the experts nor the popular individuals in attempting to create a bargaining unit. Had they known to check the network and co-opt Chris and his close friends, then they might have received the social support they needed to successfully unionize the firm. So David Crackart's case focuses on the effects of network positioning. What about cliques or social groups and their effects on workers? Long ago, in 1939, Roethlisberger and Dixon studied a bank wiring room where workers essentially created circuit boards. There, Roethlisberger and Dixon found that the friendship groups of these workers altered their rates of work output and normed those rates so that they stayed within a particular output level that worked for the set of friends. Now, subsequent scholars have remarked on how peer groups or clusters of strong-tied individuals can be a strong force in organizations and, and in terms of influencing their outcomes. I see this in my own work on American high schools and their classrooms. There, youth act with their friends in mind. In most classrooms, youth form friendship groups or cliques, and those cliques uh, lead the students to conform their behavior within them. Here's an example of one such uh, high school English composition class that I observed as a graduate student. It was composed of 11th and 12th grade students, equally well equipped to read and comprehend the course material that concerned William Shakespeare's written works. The teacher, Sophia, liked to encourage dialogue and frequently called on students. Nonetheless, the students formed clusters of association based on gender, race, and age, and these groups were rank ordered within those grades. As such, there was a, a popular core group and a hanger-on group, and this arose for each grade level. 
Interestingly, the 11th grade group and the core 12th grade group uh, did not compete on the same stage. Instead, they specialized in distinct conversational arenas and topics. So the seniors dominated the public stage of academic discussions, and the juniors dominated the backstage of social discussions about uh, parties and events uh, around the school affairs. In this matrix, you can see the friendship relations during the semester in which I observed them. I used various network analytic software packages to identify the groupings and how they broke down. In particular, there's four clicks or four clusters and you can read the ties within and between these clusters by following the row-column relationships or along the row as a from-to relationship. Hence the value of 1 from student number 16 to student number 15 is a, dot, uh, is a 1 and there's a dot from 15 to 16 and that suggests that 15 thought she was friends with 16 but 16 did not reciprocate that sentiment. So, Notably, most of the groups are homophilous by grade, gender, and race. So they follow the saying of birds of a feather flock together. Moreover, many of them have reciprocated ties, at least more so than by chance. While it's not shown, it's also the case that many of these friends sit by one another, so prop propinquity is also an effect. Um, in the matrix, you can see the smaller secondary peer, peer groups underneath the larger core grade level groups. Um, and you can see that they're hanger-ons by looking at the off-diagonal relationships between those two clusters. These secondary cliques seem to want to be friends with the larger core clique within their grade level, but it's not always reciprocated. And because of this, there's kind of a rank ordering to their clustering uh, of cliques within the class. We can render these relationships into a network image where the y-axis is the prominence or popularity of the individuals. Um, and then the shaded circles reflect general boundaries of each clique. Notably, we see that the two grades have somewhat dis are somewhat disconnected and each having a core clique uh, with a hanger-on, just like I described earlier. In other analyses, I tested whether observed interaction patterns conform to these cliques over and above the seeding and homophily effects, and they strongly do. For ease of interpretation, I'm just going to superimpose the observed behaviors and interactions on these groups. From doing so, we learn a few things. First, we learn that most of the interaction is directed within the cliques. Second, we notice that the cliques specialize their behavior. So here I'm using red to denote where task or academically focused interactions emanate. I render the, the red color bolder where the rates and densities of that kind of interaction are higher. And here it clearly shows that the core senior clique dominates such an interaction and the core clique in either grade is slightly stronger so that status is important as well as the kind of group. Next, I use blue to denote where social or non-academic interactions emanate like play, joking around, things like that. I render the blue bolder where the rates and density of such interaction is highest. Hence, the junior core dom uh, group dominates that kind of interaction and the core clique within each grade actually dominates that interaction. So you can see that the transition here, the senior group dominates tasks and then the junior group focuses on social affairs. A slew of statistics can accompany these images and further the argument. However, the point for this lecture is more conceptual and schematic. The structure of the informal network and its cliques strongly guide behaviors. That's the point. Moreover, the cliques arise from a variety of tie formation mechanisms of, say, homophily, reciprocity, status seeking, and even an effort at specialization so that they avoid competition across the groups. So the sum of this is that it's not just uh, single relationships that influence workers and their firms, but also network positioning and the groups within them that shape kind of outcomes and worker behavior.